big thank you to Levels for sponsoring this video. Go ahead and pour yourself up a cup of coffee or bone broth because this chuck roast recipe is super easy and casual. First off, let's dig out that old crock pot. This is mine and its name is Load of Crock. Simply get yourself a 3 to 5 pound chuck roast and casually toss it into your slow cooker and season it. I usually go with about 1 teaspoon per pound of roast, but you can also go with a half teaspoon per pound and adjust after it's done cooking. Cover it with a lid and turn the heat to high for 4 hours or low for 8 hours. And that's basically it. I didn't add any liquid nor did I touch it after I set my alarm. And as you can see, it's fall apart tender. And if you're wondering what that liquid is in the bottom of the crock pot, that's the jus, my dear viewer. And it's some of the richest jus you'll ever taste. It was never diluted by water, and it'll gel up nicely. Simply shred this in this delicious broth and store it. Or eat it. It's good to go, and honestly, it really doesn't need much else. If I had to give it one word to describe it, it'd be unctuous. I think I've eaten at Red Lobster one time in my life, and the only thing I remember about it was the Cheddar Bay Biscuits, and being concerned that I got food poisoning. For these carnivore cheddar bay biscuits, we're going to need to pull out our food processor and add four ounces of pork rinds to it. Follow that up with what I thought would only be two eggs, and in reality it should be four. And then toss in two ounces of cheddar, a half teaspoon of garlic powder, a half teaspoon of optional parsley flakes, a teaspoon of baking powder, and about a half teaspoon of salt. Blend this on low until reality starts to set in and add those two additional eggs I was talking about earlier. Finish blending and what you should be left with is a nice pork rind dough ball. It smells super garlicky and will be tacky to the touch. Next up, preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit and pull out a sheet pan that's lined with either a nonstick baking mat or a sheet of parchment paper. Grab that old cookie scoop you've got hiding in the drawer and start to portion out and pile two scoops per biscuit. If you don't have a cookie scoop, that's fine. Just measure each dough ball evenly and you should be left with about six of these flavor nuggets. Now, get some water on those hands to form each of these just to make it look a little nicer. Kind of like wearing blue jeans to church instead of gym shorts. Just a touch nicer. Once they're all spiffy, place them into your preheated oven for 10 to 12 minutes or until they have just started to firm up. While they're still hot, brush them down with a little salted butter. If you can't find a brush like me, just kind of pour it on top of each one. Let these handsome little guys cool off and then plate them up. Ripping these apart is a nice experience, and tasting them is even nicer. The flavor is the most important part here because, to be honest, they're a touch dense. But the form factor plus the flavor makes a winning combo. Enjoy these with your garlic butter shrimp, and feel better that you won't get food poisoning because you saw yourself wash your hands before making these. But you don't need to wash your hands to take care of your metabolic health. One of the single biggest predictors of how long you live and how good you feel while living is your metabolic health. I strongly believe that you can't manage what you don't measure, and metabolic health can be difficult to measure. This is why I use Levels to track my daily health metrics and habits, and ultimately, optimize my metabolic health. Levels helps me understand how my food and my lifestyle decisions are impacting my health. In the short term, I use Levels to optimize my energy levels during the day and manage my weight. In the long term, I'm thinking about the many chronic diseases that are directly linked to metabolic health, including diabetes, heart disease and Alzheimer's. I have used levels with a continuous glucose monitor to get my own personalized data, which I have found to be really powerful to understand my own unique physiology, but you can also now use levels without a continuous glucose monitor. I found it really shocking that when doing a test of eating bread versus doing a test of eating sugar-free candy, that my blood glucose spiked dramatically when eating the sugar-free candy. It really made me want to focus more on real food versus trying to find some fake alternative. Using Levels has personally helped me to understand how my blood sugar correlated to my health and how I was feeling at certain times throughout the day as well. It's more than a calorie tracker, it's a personal health tracker. Levels has some exciting features to help you track your macros, protein, fiber, fat, carbohydrates, and sugar, and to create daily habits around your health goals. They also provide insights based on trends in your health metrics to help guide you to make the decisions that will help have a positive impact on your health. Right now, Levels is offering my viewers an additional two free months of the Levels annual membership when you use my link, levels.link slash carnivoruschef. I don't know how long this offer will last, so if you're interested in learning more about your metabolic health, now is the time to get started. Big thank you to Levels for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to it. For the salmon and bacon pinwheel, I'm going to need you to do as I say and not as I do. First off, let's start with at least an 8 ounce skinless salmon fillet. Not the 6 ounce fillet that I have here. Grab your sharpest knife and begin to split it in half so that we have a nice even thin piece of fish. Just be careful not to cut all the way through it. Next up, let's get about 4 to 5 pieces of some normal cut bacon. Don't use super thick cut bacon like I have here. It took a bit too long for my liking to get this bacon cooked thoroughly and it dried out the salmon. Simply lay the bacon on top of the salmon to cover it entirely, but leaving about one inch at the end to be able to completely seal when we roll it up. Speaking of rolling, start tightly rolling this up towards the end of the salmon that you left exposed. You can use butcher twine to wrap this even tighter, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Once it's wrapped, split it in half, and you'll be left with some nice looking little fish swirls. 
Season this up with some salt and pepper before placing it onto a baking sheet that's lined with parchment paper. Put it into an oven that's been preheated to 375 degrees Fahrenheit for about 8 to 10 minutes or until it looks a bit like this. I had to cook my thick ass bacon much longer, but the 8 to 10 minutes should be good if you follow the written directions. And they're beautiful. Like a little fish and pork rose. Squeeze over a little lemon and enjoy the fruits. I mean, fish of our labor. Alright, take out those Paris Hilton collection knives and a couple of beautiful chickens. The knife is honestly more important than the chicken, but the chicken is pretty nice to have for this recipe. And honestly, this isn't as much of a recipe as it is a tutorial on how to easily roast a chicken. To start, get your chicken out of the package if it's in one. Remove all the random bits that it comes stuffed inside and set those to the side. And for this first one, I'm simply going to use salt. And a good bit of it as well. Maybe a tablespoon or even more. Take your salt and sprinkle it all over the chicken. You'll want to get into every nook and cranny that you could possibly think of, but you especially want to hit the cavity. And that's really it. I'm doing some meal prep and want a couple of different flavors going on. So for the second one, I'm going to be using some jalapeno ranch from my company, Carnivore Companion. If you're interested in checking out our awesome line of seasonings, the link will be below. Next up, I let these just kind of sit in the seasoning for about 30 minutes at room temp to draw out some excess liquid. If you're short on time, you can actually just skip this step, but it does help to let that seasoning seep into the chicken a bit more. Remove the liquid if you did this, and now we can place our birds into the oven at 425 degrees Fahrenheit for about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. What you're really looking for is for the breast to have an internal temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the chicken is out, carryover cooking will allow the meat to hit a target of 165 degrees Fahrenheit because we will be letting it rest for about 20 minutes before we dig in. And we'll cook a whole chicken like this. The goal is to keep the white meat as juicy as possible and the dark meat as tender as possible. And if you ask me, that's one juicy breast. Shout out to Chef John from Food Wishes for this method. I learned it from him years ago and it's worked every single time. All right, I have a craving for a French onion dip. And I'm tired of pork rinds for the time being, so I need to get some chips made from ham? Makes sense, right? Using thin sliced deli meat to dehydrate into chips? I know there are companies that do this already, but if you're like me and in debt up to your eyeballs from being an idiot in your 20s, then you can't afford those fancy chips. Sure, they are delicious and simple, but this is also delicious and simple. Not ingredient-wise, this ham is the amalgamation of multiple pigs pressed into a loaf and scattered with preservatives. At least, this ham is. Feel free to pick any deli meat that you prefer. There are options out there that aren't as trashy as Smith-filled quote-unquote smoked ham. Anyways, you want to slice your ham or whatever deli meat you choose into chip shapes. If you have some of that perfectly circle ham, then you'll get a better time at making some nice triangles. Mine is looking a bit oblong, but still worth a try. Place all of your ham into a dehydrator at the max temp for about 4-5 to five hours or until they have a definite crisp to them. And that's really all for the chip portion. And you can really just stop there if you want, but... I still want the French onion dip, and for that, we need to get a yellow onion diced up. Throw that into a pan, and we have a couple of options here. The best way to caramelize onions is to place the onions over low to medium-low heat with a pinch of salt and let them just go for an hour or two, stirring occasionally. But what I'm going to do, since I'm short on time, is throw them over medium heat with a little salt and olive oil. Once they start to sizzle, add in about three tablespoons of water to let the onions start to soften. This will also help to pull out the sugars in the onion. This will make it stick to the pan, which also makes the fond. Add some more water to release that fond and stir that into your onions. Repeat this process until your onions are soft and nicely caramelized. Place these into a bowl along with one pound of sour cream. Season that up with about a quarter teaspoon of salt and a big pinch of black pepper or white pepper. White pepper would actually be a bit nicer here, but I didn't have any and this was still tasty. Give this a mix and let it sit for about 20 minutes to let those flavors marry. And the chips are done. Sometimes on the carnivore diet, you just need the experience of things that you used to eat. And these ham chips definitely have a similar crisp to lay potatoes chips, but with the bold flavor of smoked ham. This definitely didn't suck, and I think you should try it out. We do family meal at the restaurant on Friday, and it was my turn to make something. This one is definitely keto, and the portion size is meant for 20 people. If that's not your style, I'll understand if you click off the video. But to start, we're going to need one yellow onion that's been roughly chopped. Throw that into the bottom of a pan and pull out some of that handy candy, aka grape tomatoes. We're going to need about 5 pounds worth. On top of that, we're going to use just a little garlic, probably 30 to 35 cloves. Season this up with your favorite Italian herb blend or herbs de Provence. I went with about 3 tablespoons here. You can dose it up if you think it's necessary. Next up is going to be 1-ish tablespoon of black pepper, then 2 teaspoons of chili flakes, about two tablespoons of salt, and for the braising liquid, I went with about 750 milliliters of Cabernet Sauvignon. You can use any dry red wine you want here, or you can just stick with chicken stock. Hell, even a nice Chardonnay would be good here. 
Finish that up with six cups of chicken stock and give everything a nice mix. For the star of the show, I'm going to be using two pork butts. I wanted more surface area in my braising liquid, so I cut it into smaller pieces. Place it into the mix and then into an oven that's set to 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about an hour to get an initial roasting of the pork and to get that liquid hot. After that hour, cover tightly with parchment paper and foil. This will help to retain the heat and to braise all of those veggies and pork. Place it back into the oven at 275 degrees Fahrenheit for five hours or so or until the pork is just about fall apart tender. Unwrap it and place it back into your oven at 375 degrees Fahrenheit to get everything on top deeply roasted. We're just developing flavor here. Once that's done, remove it and let it rest for about 30 minutes just so that it's a bit easier to work with. The bone from the pork butt should come out clean and now we're ready to separate the pork from the braising liquid and then we want to separate the veggies from the liquid. Get the, these veggies will be our sauce but the braising liquid is still good and can be drank like a nice Italian bone broth, so don't toss it. Now that everything is separated, get all of your veggies into a blender and blend until smooth. Give it a taste for salt and season as needed. And it should look like this. Now we could focus on the pork by getting it all broken up into smaller pieces. And I'm going to be using a potato masher to get it nice and shredded. Place the pork back into your pan and pour over all the sauce. If it's looking a little dry, add some of your braising liquid to add moisture. Mix everything well, and that's it. This is great on its own, but if you're into spaghetti squash, it'd be great over that as well.